Davis was scheduled to die. The Supreme Court has not yet weighed in. We are broadcasting in this Democracy Now! Uh, special broadcast on the grounds of the prison. There are, I don't know, hundreds if a thousand people outside protesting at this prison, about 150 the max allowed by the prison authorities inside. Ben Jealous, CEO of the NAACP, with us. So what does this mean right now? Um, right now, at 7 o'clock, the Supreme Court has not yet weighed in. You know, we are segregated over here, apart from our staff and our lawyers. Um, Troy's lawyers are inside. Um, we will uh, su su suspect here official announcement very shortly from the prison. Um, barring a miracle, this means that Troy Davis is being executed right now. Doesn't doesn't the Supreme Court have to weigh in? What I'm saying is that we've been segregated over here for several minutes. We don't know what's what's happened in those minutes. And so in this type of situation, you're literally in a limbo where it's just unclear until you hear an official announcement. Uh, everything, you know, the lawyers are now inside. Um, the guards are there assembled. Phone lines are kept open. Um, but you literally, until somebody comes out from, from that sort of inner sanctum um, that is... Uh, the uh, death chamber and death row to let us know, uh, to confirm, it is literally impossible right now, Amy, to know what's to know what's happening. I want to ask Larry Cox to join you. Larry Cox, executive director of Amnesty International. Um, Larry Cox, Ben Jealous, Amnesty International, NAACP. These are the organizations that have been spearheading the demand for clemency for Troy Davis. It's 7 p.m. Eastern time, the moment that Troy Davis was scheduled to die. Yes, but as we've been saying in the meeting that people just gathered together, you can kill a body, but you cannot kill a spirit. And the spirit that has been ignited by Troy Davis and this fight, that spirit is going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. There's only one answer to this insanity, this evil, and that is to wipe out the death penalty once and for all. So no other human being, no other family has to go through this horror again. And no other people has to go through this horror again. And that's what we are going to do. In our country. In, in our, our country, country and in our world. We are not going to let Troy Davis's fight die today. And, well, you know, and there's some, you know, this, uh, this day is, I guess, the uh, 105th anniversary of the massacre known as the Atlanta Race Riots. I was talking to the young people across the street that it was moments like those that the NAACP rose out of. Moments of feeling absolutely helpless, but it kicked like the nation was absolutely in just. In those moments, people find a, an ability to hold on to a spirit that it is possible to make our democracy actually rise as high as its own aspirations. Troy Davis, the remarkable thing about him is that he never gave up, not in himself or his story of innocence, but gave up in this country and hoping for a miracle that the justice system would actually work. And the reality is that we all in this moment have to commit ourselves to making sure that the justice system does work. Now, that is what patriotism is. We hear a lot of definitions of patriotism in this country. But patriotism is what was shown by Troy Davis saying, you know, you know let's hold out hope to, to the last minute. Always hold out hope to, to the last minute. This is not supposed to happen here. What did Troy tell you the last time you saw him? The last time he's... It's part of the reasons... We're hearing some kind of cheer that has gone up. Live. All the different reporters are here. 
We just broadcast your speech. This is Democracy Now! And tell us who you are and what your thoughts are right now. I'm Rosalind Brock, and I'm chairman of the board of the NAACP. This is the youngest chair of the board of the NAACP. What did you just hear? I just heard that is, he just received a stay. And we serve a God who is able, and we're so grateful right now. Troy Anthony Davis. Well, the United 
United States is a leader in the practice of killing prisoners. Uh, there are only five nations that are responsible for 90% of all the executions in the world, and the United States is one of them, along with China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, and then the United States of America. That puts us in the company of some of the worst human rights violators in the world. It puts us out of uh, sync with our strongest allies in the world. So this has long been uh, something that's a scandal uh, for the United States of America. That's why people are here, and anyone watching this can only wonder what is it about this country? What is the insanity that grips this country that it spends this kind of money, these kinds of resources, because it wants to kill a human being, rather than using these resources, this money, this energy, to do something to protect us? That's what the world is wondering. All around the world, right now, we know there are people at U.S. embassies making precisely this point. How can you do this? At the news conference that you and others held earlier at the local church, no, uh, Ben Jealous and Laura has that the lawyers. So I just, I just went over and, and spoke to one of the lawyers who's on site here. And just for the record, I want to let people know at 7-11, Troy Davis was scheduled to die at 7 Eastern time. And so what the lawyers are now saying is that we have a temporary, re a temporary delay from the Supreme Court. This is a reprieve, not a stay. It, this is something that could be minutes, it could be hours. Um, but um, uh, literally, the Supreme Court has just asked them to hold off while the Supreme Court considers it our plea. And so we're just in a holding pattern right now. Will you be staying here today? Yeah, we will, of course. Yes, of we course. are here. We will be here. We will be here. We will, yes. We're not going anywhere. Have you seen this before? I mean, this week uh, there was a, a death row case that was just stayed in Texas. That's right. And we have seen it before in the case of Troy, where he was within, you know, minutes of being executed and the Supreme Court intervened. So it happens. It's one of the uh, grotesque uh, cruelties of this practice that at the last minute uh, people are saved. So we hope and we pray that this is the case uh, right now. But we just have to wait and see. And you can imagine what the family is going through and what this does. In the background, uh, I don't know if you can pick up, people are singing, uh, give peace a chance. Laura Moy, you're with Amnesty. Uh, you've been in Georgia now for, what, 12 years? Not here currently, but I lived here for 16 years, and I was here at the beginning of our work on Troy Davis when our first rallies for Troy included 40 people. And here we are now, and there are hundreds of people down here, hundreds of people across the street lining the highway. Uh, hundreds of people gathered in prayer around the Davis family. Uh, there are multiple events happening around the world and around the country in solidarity with us right now. And so you wait. We wait. We wait and we, we wait with hope and uh, determination. We wait with the family. The family is actually just right behind us, That's is right. that right? They are. Now, were they able to go... Did, what was the decision involved with Troy Davis um, not having family members, or does he, uh, to, if in fact he is executed, to witness? In the state of Georgia, they simply do not allow family members to witness executions. Uh, the family of the murder victims are allowed to do that, but not the, not the prisoners' families. So prisoners' families often come here and join us when we form uh, the vigil on execution nights, but they're not allowed to be uh, near the prison. So they cannot witness? No. No. And of course, maybe many don't want to witness. Yes. Yes. This is a very controlled environment. When you come onto the grounds here, uh, your car is searched, uh, dogs are brought out to sniff your cars. Uh, it's a very controlled environment, and for whatever reason, they have decided as a policy that family members cannot witness an execution. Right behind you, a sign is being held up. NAACP says, too much doubt. It's a large picture of Troy Davis. It says, save Troy Davis, hashtag, too much doubt. This is Democracy Now!, a special live broadcast from the death row prison in Jackson, Georgia, where death row prisoners are held until they are executed. It is 7-14. 
Hi, this is Troy's, Troy's nephew, Dijon. He's visiting him on death row every, almost every week of his life. I know Dijon because he came to Democracy Now! Studios with his mother, Martina. Martina, who you just heard in the church, standing up in the wheelchair that Dijon was holding on to. Dijon, you're 17 now. Your uncle, Troy, has been in prison your whole life. Yeah, so, but, you know, that hasn't stopped me from making a very, very, very strong connection, a unique connection with my uncle. You know, he only would want the best of me, and that's all he ever put it, installed in me over my years. And, you know, this, this even if the execution goes on today, it would not break me now. It only made me stronger. That's the thing that he installed in me, to don't let anything break you down. Just go straight on, head on, and learn on, and learn from it, and be a stronger man than you are, than you once was. And, you know, uh, you know I'm being strong for my family, I'm being strong for myself, and, you know, I I'm still, still going to go out and speak on behalf of my uncle. He's still fighting for injustice everywhere. And, you know, just still be the man, the young man that I can be to the best of my ability. You visited your uncle every weekend? Um, well, we did when I was younger. Then we started going every other weekend. But, where do you live compared to where he's imprisoned here? Uh, just about four hours away. Four hours what away. were those trips like for you? Um, the trip, after a while, the trips became, you know, just second nature. It wasn't anything serious at all. Um, the trips are very fun. You know, I have the time with my family in the car, and then we go to see Troy, have another good time. And so it's just a very, very uh, good eight-hour trip there and back. And, you know, so there's nothing to be sad about when we go in there. something that we actually look forward to going to see him. What has your uncle taught you? Um, respect, as, uh, most importantly, uh, dignity, honor, um, and just just to, how, how to recognize injustice, how to recognize fairness, and how to recognize peace all over the world. And, you know, he always told me to keep my head in my books and just to educate myself. And by him telling me that, I've educated myself to learn when someone's treating me, being treated wrong and when someone's human and civil rights are being violated. And since I know those things, it's my right as a human being to stand up and fight against those things until those things are brought to justice. You're going to college, aren't you? Yes, I'm going to uh, plan on attending Georgia Tech for body engineering. I spoke to your mother a few days ago, to Martina Correa, your uncle's older sister. She's extremely proud of you, and she says you won't stop growing. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I just continue to educate myself, continue to keep myself in, in the loop of everything that's going on. And, you know, being that, that's how I got, that's how, who I am today, and I won't stop until I feel that, when I know that all human rights, all injustice, everything is just the way it should be. You've actually trained as an activist. Can you talk? Talk about what kinds of things you've done during the summer and during the year. Um, I've been to, I've been mentored by Mr. Benjamin Todd Jealous, Mr. Larry Cox, um, various other uh, leaders around this world, and you know, I've just been taking bits and pieces of what they have done and just studying them and you know, put into me and trying to form my own self as I grow up. And you know, that's all I can do. And I just take those things and I just, I run with them and I go from there. Yeah, the, the first time we met, he was, he was Ben Jealous. The first time we met, he was three years old. And um, Troy's uh, mom came up, I mean, um, Dijon's mom, Troy's sister, Martina, came up and she said, you know, my brother's innocent. And uh, that day I said to her, you know, bring us the evidence and we'll, and we'll all fight. We'll all fight. But over those years, what has been most, two things have been consistent. One, Martina has succeeded in accumulating the evidence. Bit by bit, the case has fallen apart. The other thing is that Dijon has just risen from being as high as my knee, as tall as he is now, and just grown stronger and stronger and wiser and wiser, uh, just into a better and better, finer and finer young man. And you know, that doesn't happen um, just because you have mentors who drop in and drop out. You can call or text. It happens because you have some people in your life who are very consistent. And Troy has been incredibly consistent. You know, when, when, when we were visiting a few weeks ago, we had, we, we had hours. It was just the two of us. Troy and I, he was, he talked with such pride about Dijon. And I said, you know, what do you try to teach him? And he talked about, you know, the importance of teaching Dijon, how, you know, about college, about right from wrong, uh, about how to, to comport yourself with uh, uh, dignity as a young man. There are fathers who are with their children every day who don't make that sort of investment. Um, and their sons, let alone their nephews. 
and that's where and I think part of you know why so many of us are affected so deeply is we know this is an innocent man. We also know this is a very decent man who has spent the last, you know last 20 years trying to prepare his 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 his, his family for life, prepare the movement for victory, and prepare Dijon in the last 17 years for success. Your mother also. I mean, your mother and your uncle have been fighting for their lives. Certainly your mother has been fighting for your uncle's life and her own as she fights breast cancer, her face adorning the mammogram uh, vans in Savannah, fighting for mammograms for poor women. Um, what has your mother taught you, Dijon? Um, you know, she's taught me to, you know, stay always, don't don't get the big head no matter how smart I do, no matter how um, much attention I get in the world and no matter, you know, how much I reach out, always remember who you come, where you come from, always remember your background and never forget that because if you forget your background then you're just basically forgetting the people who you grew up with and you're turning your back on the people who you most love and who actually brought you up to where you are. But also his his grandmother, I mean one of the things is that you know, when you get to know the, the Davis family you realize that the grandmother who passed this summer, or spring um, was an activist too she was an active member of the civil rights movement, of the, you know, of our association, um somebody who took part in sit-ins and really raised her daughters and her sons uh, to, to have politics, to think about the world, to think about what they could do to make the world a better place. And so it's important to understand that that in that respect, all of them, Martina, Dejan, Troy, really reflect this 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 very beautiful grandmother. Vangelis, if the McPhails uh, were watching this right now, um, what would you say to them, Mark McPhail, the police? officer who was killed in 1989. What we all understand as we look at this case is that Officer McPhail was a hero. He was not on duty that night. He was working as a security guard, and quite frankly, the requirements for security guards are very different than for officers of the, the law. And, and yet, he did his duty. He went to protect a homeless man who was being attacked, and he gave his life trying to protect the life of a homeless man. I mean, quite frankly, with the headlines we're seeing today from California about officers who beat up a homeless man, let's be clear that McPhail was, was a very special kind of hero. And he deserves justice. But justice must be precise and exact. And yeah, somebody who was, uh, just frankly, the, the, the month I was appointed to this job, my uh, young cousin was killed in front of the KFC in Columbia, Maryland. And we found out later that they were coming for a gangbanger and they mistook my cousin for the gangbanger. You know, I, I know that the uh, healing um, takes a long time. The closure never really comes. Again, justice must be exact. And as long as there's doubt, then what that means is that there's also doubt that the real killer is out there. Um, it's important that the real killer be, be found and brought to justice. But when the he former head of the FBI has doubt, when Bob Barr, is not just a former congressman, but a former co prosecutor has doubt, then the cause of justice has to, to go on until we know precisely who killed Officer McPhail and that person's brought to justice. Your uncle has gotten four stays of execution. So you have lived through many of these, Dijon. Uh, this is the fourth death warrant that has been signed. Three others uh, were reprieves. How do you get through this? And even just now, everyone wildly cheering, did you think that a stay had been issued? Um, we thought, but we're not sure yet. We're still waiting on the Supreme Court because they stepped in just to look at, they have um, opinions about it and what they're going to do, so we're waiting on them to give their verdict. But, um, you know, through the three that we had previously, you know, just been faith and determination and, you know, just a pride to never give up. And the reality is that this delay, no matter how temporary, is a miracle itself. I mean, we were there at 7 o'clock. It was, it was eerily silent. Then we hear cheers coming. And there's calls about a, a stay. It turns out the stay wasn't a stay. It was a reprieve. And it's, seven, but it's, a, it's 7.23 right now. And that's 23 more minutes than the state of Georgia intended for Troy Davis to live. And each one of those minutes is a miracle. And it affirms the faith of Troy Davis and the family. That's right.
Any final words to John tonight, just in these few minutes? Um, yeah, we, I won't. I know I won't stop fighting for what's right. I know Ben won't stop fighting for right for what's right. I hope. I know none of these people out here will stop fighting for what's right. And you know, as long as we have all these people out here fighting for Troy Davis, I know we can get them fighting out for other brothers and other sisters who are in the same predicament as Troy Davis as well. And like my uh, mother came over that shirt, I am Troy Davis. We are Troy Davis, and you could be Troy Davis too, Miss Amy Goodman. And you know, it's just it's just a miracle, and it's a very strong presence that we have and you know um, like I said you know we won't give up and this won't be the end it's only make us stronger thank you so much Dijon thank you Ben Jealous I see a colleague of yours right here um, the senior pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta a an historic church Dr. Martin Luther King senior and juniors church um, the senior pastor here Raphael Warnock welcome to democracy now thank you very much you know, Martin Luther King Jr. used to say that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. There's a whole lot of truth in that one statement. Uh, the fight for justice is long. It is difficult. Uh, it has many turns and bends in the road. And uh, there's no better example of that uh, than the Troy Davis case. Uh, this is a case in, in which um, uh, clearly there's just too much doubt for an execution for those who support an execution, uh, and yet we are here. And uh, no one no one would have predicted that we would be standing in the place where we're standing now. There's been a delay. Uh, we don't quite know what's going on at this point. Uh, but uh, it suggests uh, that this road that leads to freedom and justice is difficult. And whatever the outcome tonight, we have to keep struggling. Uh, today at the uh, church, I, I saw you. And I want to just grab this piece of paper. 